drive services and, and just one of the po powerful altar times that we have, that we've had over in, and go ahead to the next one. And go ahead to the next one. And you're going to see people that you recognize and, and keep going. And keep going. Some of the young men that come over. Now stop right there for a second. The reason I, and he would, he would be mortified if he knew I showed this out in public. The reason that I stopped with this slide is because this. This man had been coming, he came to our Christmas service last year. And his wife had been coming the entire time we've been at, been at Worship Life. And she'd be coming week after week. And she kept saying, pray for my husband. And we started praying for him. And, and suddenly about March or so, he started coming every once in a while. Um, he'd come one service, then he'd be gone a while, or he'd come back. And he carried the worst language on Facebook I've ever seen. And he, I mean, all bad, bad, bad things. And so um, I noticed, though, I'd become friends with him on Facebook. And, and I noticed, uh, Tom, that, that there was a point where his Facebook post, he would do this rant. I mean, he would rant. Everybody knows what a rant is. If you got a mama, you know what a rant is. Um, he would do this rant on Facebook, and then at the bottom of it, he would say, I'm sorry, Pastor Jeff. <laughs> and so I thought, wow, God's doing a work. He's still ranting, but God's doing a work. And so months, days turned into months, weeks, and, and finally, he'd been coming this entire summer. And she told me one day, she said, please pray for Terry. He's, in, he's under conviction really bad. And he missed one service, and he said to me after he put this thing on Facebook, and he said on, he said on Facebook, I'm, I'm not able to go to church today because my brother had car trouble. And he's the kind of brother that every time I've ever had needed help, that he's always came to my rescue, and so I went to help him today. So what did I do? I did the preacher thing and said, oh, we missed you. Hope you come back next week. No, I didn't. I went underneath what he said, and I said, you know, it reminds me of a story in the Bible where Jesus was with some religious people, and he, and he said to them, because he healed on the Sabbath day, and they said to him, what are you doing? And he said, which one of you, if you had an ox in the ditch or a child down the well, would, give, would even look and see what day it was? If your brother's been the kind of man that it sounds like he's supposed to be to you, then your place was with him today. Guess what, people? It won him to Jesus. Listen, I, we've had, center people have had enough of church folk, me included, of me. I, I have, I, I'm even looking at things that I would have dealt with in certain ways and going, well, I know how I'm not going to do that. Because that's what, what I would have always done. And so I went underneath, I just said, sounds like you were where you're supposed to be. Well, the next Sunday came, and, or almost the Sunday, and she said, I don't think he's coming because he's under conviction really, really bad. And so... Um, I don't know. I said something on Facebook about looking forward tomorrow, and I hope Terry's there. And by this time, we're into September, Helen. We're into September. We get into September, and suddenly on a Sunday morning, at, at the end of my message in an altar call, here come this big old guy, 48 years old, never been in church in his life, and he's probably one of the most... Um, just he'll just flat tell you what's on his mind and he comes out of that seat and he got about right there and big tears streaming down his face and I'm going to tell you a couple weeks passed and I baptized that man in our building over there and he has not been the same since that day that he came forward now I'm going to tell you something else that happened that day. It started something in the body of people. Believe it or not, if you win somebody to Jesus, it will excite you. And in this excitement Things started happening. You can go on to the next one. In, in, on the next one, the next week, this, this guy that's in the white T-shirt was supposed to sing it all, in offering tonight, and, and uh, something came up, and he, well, he's not here. And I've known him for about mm, six or seven years now, and, and um, he'd gotten away from the Lord, and here he come. I mean, he just come busting in one Sunday and made his heart right with God and just went radical. I mean, crazy radical. And then about a, about a week after big guy Terry came, the guy on the other side, which is his brother Jacob, he, come, he came in. And when Jacob came in, ne, ne, he, had, he didn't have a, a church reference to go by. He just came in. And in the middle of service, he got saved in the offering. Now, 
I'm going to tell you, I got up that morning singing a Crab Family song, and I wondered why. I was like, Lord, why am I singing this song? And Brad, one of my friends, got up to give up to take the offering. And, I mean, he's just blubbering, trying to take up the offering and, and saying what God has done for him. And, and, and so I said, man, I know why you've, you've said that. We, can't, we need to have an invitation right now because I know where that's coming from. And we begin to sing that song. And, man, here this guy come, 23 years old. And, and he is one of the people. The reason I'm running a race is because of those two young men that you're looking at on that picture. Go ahead to the next one. Last week, we went to the ramp and took some of the kids that you're going to see in some of these pictures, and they experienced uh, just three, about 3,500 young people just jumping and dancing. Uh, listen, it wasn't a concert. No, it wasn't a winter jam. Winter jam's fine, but it wasn't a winter jam. This was a full-out worship experience. If you were on that trip last week, I want you to stand up. If you were on that trip, stand up. All right, let's give them a hand. Go into the next one. And I picked this picture for a reason. Now, I didn't know this picture was um, even had even been taken. But you guys know that we've been having a Thursday night prayer. And in that Thursday night prayer, we have um, uh, been calling out specific things. And I've got a list that lays on the pulpit over there of just names, name after name after name. And I've actually got a prayer shawl that we drape over it. And, and, and we've been writing names and, and have been seeing Jacob, the one that you saw in a, in a couple of slides ago, we had actually wrote his name on that prayer list on a Thursday, and he got saved on Sunday. I n I'd never met him before. He just, yeah, write it down. It happened. And so we've been praying for about eight weeks, and the young man that, you're gonna, that you see there in that striped sweater, um, he, had, he came over here on a Sunday night. He'd been coming to our service a couple of times. He stayed in the back. He made me promise that no one would pull him out and pray for him, and I did. And uh, um, he'd been coming every week. And so I was on my face, Pastor, because you we, we usually start with a few minutes of just corporate worship prayer. And so I was on my face on the stage over there. And I got up from that about 10 minutes, Carolyn, into, into prayer. And I looked and I was like, who's that kid? Who's Because he had his hood down over his head. And, and I was like, who's that kid? And I walk around and one of my workers there said, told me who it was, which I figured out it was him. And, and I asked Todd later, Todd and Angela were there at prayer, and I said, what happened? He said, I don't know. He come busting in here. <laughs> he said, all I noticed is all of a sudden the doors flung open, and that boy ran to the altar as hard as he could run. Yeah. Now, listen, there wasn't an invitation. There was no music going. Well, I mean, we had CD playing. There, was, there wasn't a band playing. There wasn't a message preached. We were in corporate prayer, and this young man come running and gave his heart back to Jesus. That is why I'm in a race. That is why I hope that you will re-sign up tonight. That is why that if your race has gotten a little, I just, I just want to encourage you. I don't want to beat you over the head. I want to encourage you. Give me that next slide. Because you're about, some of you about to shout in just a minute. I'm going to tell you right now. I want you to look up at this. We, when we moved into the building that you guys had on Martell Road, I put one scripture up. And if you drive by there very often, you see that it hasn't changed in a year. It's been the same. Not because I'm lazy, but because it's what God gave us. And it is this. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. If you've driven by that building, you see that scripture over there on, on the sign. The reason it hasn't changed is because we've been, I've been looking, staring back at about 35 or 40 white people ever since day one. And suddenly, and suddenly... Some things started happening in the heavens. Suddenly, some things started happening. And so I want to show you, show you what was, this was taken from this morning, where the girl in the end has a Filipino descent. The boy in the red pants is Hispanic. Zach is as white as a cracker. <laughs> and his two lovely sisters on the other side are African American. And I said, now, God, you're giving us the nations. <laughs> now. Pastor David, I say, I almost told you this because, you know, after church is over, I usually send Pastor David, hey, we had this many, this happened or whatever. And I saved this one because I wanted you to wait and hear it at this moment. And give me that next slide. This morning, I preached my message with an interpreter in Spanish. I know that we have a Hispanic pastor coming. I'm not, I'm not trying to get ahead of that. I also know this. I got a row full of Spanish people that don't understand English. And if I'm going to bring them into our body, I better start saying some Spanish. Amen. And so this morning, it wasn't planned. 
they came in, and there was that whole row, and I was like, well, they're not going to understand the thing I'm saying. And then I said, oh, yes, they will. I said, Jose, I'm about to preach. Come here. He come over, and he stood beside me, and he interpreted everything I said in Spanish, and it was awesome. And I'm going to tell you that God is calling us to run a race. Tonight, I want, to, I want you to, uh, to go uh, with me, and it'll be up on the screen as well, to Hebrews chapter 12. And this is from the New Living Translation, and I, I'm, I love, I, I read the, the New King James when I'm doing my reading, and I, I'll bounce over to other translations, and I don't pretend to know everything about every one of them. But sometimes there's a translation that just says to me exactly what I, what I needed for it to say, to, uh, to explain to me, to, to make me understand what the, what the writer is meaning, meaning. And so in Hebrews chapter 12, it says this, Therefore... Since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. God, I pray right now that you would seal your word. God, God, I ask that you would allow me just to hide behind you, God. I, I'm not preaching myself. I'm not preaching my own kingdom, but God, we're praying for your kingdom to be advanced. God, I'm praying that we will leave here, God, with a brand new fire in our souls. I'm praying, God, that we will be encouraged, God, by your word. I'm praying, God, that we will have a determination like we've never had before. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in a race. Whether you know it tonight, you are hurtling towards something if you are sitting still you are not sitting still well how's that possible well you're five seconds older than you were just five seconds ago you're hurtling towards something and why does why do you think I know you know I hear these new age people all the time say but there's no time in God then why in the world does he talk about time so much if there's no time in God then why does he say it's high time if, if it's all just going to work itself out, why does he say it's important? It's high time to wake out of your sleep because today your salvation is closer than it was the day before. Why? Because we're in a race. Why didn't he just say tiptoe through the tulips and get there the best way you can? No, he said we are in a race. And I'm going to tell you something. How do we do it? How do we run the race? I would say the first thing I would do, according to that scripture, by looking at that scripture, um, it's not just grab on your gear and start running. What does the scripture say first? Therefore, seeing we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses. The first thing I'm going to tell you is that we need to look, about, look and see who's around us. Now, I know that, the, that there's a cloud of witnesses in heaven. I know that, that I can be encouraged by Abraham, Sarah, Jacob, uh, Moses, Enoch, Noah, all of the people that have shown me great, great faith. And I can be encouraged by that, and it can increase my, my race. But I also know this. I am surrounded by a cloud of witnesses that are saying to me, come on, you can do better. Come on, get up. And those are words I can actually hear. Remember when you were down, but okay, it's okay, get up. Let's move forward. Let's keep our eye on the prize. So the first thing I'm going to tell you that we got to do is look around. Will you say that with me? Look around. I'm in a race and I got to look around. Because we have others who have ever lived in Bible times throughout history and even our own history or present, we can, because we have those people surrounding us, they're encouraging us. We can look to them to see the application of that faith. Then he gives us some instruction, and here's the next thing. He says, we got to lay aside. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin. Other translations say, let us lay aside every weight and sin. Why do you think they're not the same? Your job may not be a sin, but it can be a weight. Your family life, the things going on in your family life, the turmoil, the, the, the things that are going on, they may not be a sin, but they can be a weight. And so the writer in Hebrews says, let us lay aside every weight and sin. I'm going to tell you tonight, if you're going to run this race, you're going to have to lay some stuff down. Some of you under the sound of my voice are going to have to lay some sins down. Some of us under the sound of my voice are going to have to lay some sins down. Tonight, some of us under the sound of my voice are going to have to lay some weight down. You've been carrying around that thing way too long. I could break, I could stop and go into an altar call right now and say, come on, let's bring that weight down. We got to lay aside. So the first thing he says is we got to lay aside every weight and sin. The next thing he says is let us run. 
Let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Another translation says, let us run with patience the race that's set before us. I think it's interesting that the Word of God uses the term race here. It's because, you know, in any race that we, that we go, if we go see a marathon, if I go watch a, 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 a Daytona 500 or one of, those, one of those races, there's always a starting point and there's an ending point. Maybe for some of you, your starting point hasn't come, but it's going to come tonight. Maybe some of you started a long time ago and you, it's just about time that you get back on the way again. And keep moving forward. Life is just not sitting still. There's a race towards something. The Bible says that there's a narrow way that leads to life. And there's a broad way that leads to destruction. There's two paths in the race. I love the fact that there is a starting line and there's a finishing line. What I love about the finishing line is this. My relationship with Jesus says that he's at the end. And he is encouraging me and he's going to the father on my behalf and he's cheering me on and he's carried my sickness and my pain and my sin. And yet he's still saying, come on. I want you to say, I got to lay some stuff down and I got to run. Amen. If you, if you know anything about running, um, and I, 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 I just thought when I was putting this together, it's kind of funny that a fat guy would be talking to you about running. That's okay. You can laugh. I know I'm fat. Um, if it, that a fat guy would talk to you about running, and here's why. God doesn't care what size you are, what physical shape you're what color you are. He doesn't care where you were yesterday. All he wants is you putting one foot in front of the other. As long as there is life in me and breath in me, I can run. And I can run a race. And you better, you better watch out because I'm going to be running right beside you, and I may just run past you if you let me. But you're not going to let me, right? Because you're going to run as hard as I am. Amen. But there's some discipline. I want you to look at verse 2 that comes here. It says, we do this. This is how we run. This is how we run. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people, and then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. When you think about quitting, look at Jesus. When you think about throwing in the towel, look at Jesus. When you think about giving up, when you think that you can't keep up, when, when things aren't going the way that you think they should go, when mountains are in your way, when obstacles are in your way, when the path gets slick, when the path gets tough, look at Jesus. The word says, think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. Think about Jesus and you won't give up. Keep focus, keep your go. I want you to know tonight that running comes with discipline. Anything we do for the Lord, it, it comes with discipline. Discipline is a bad word in, the, in our youth culture now. Because, you, you know, you do timeouts and, and all these things, or you talk it through, or you're, you want to, you know, I'm, I'm so tired of parents that want to be best friends with their kids. We had, we had just a few weeks, you know, occasion, my house is not made out of gingerbread, and it is not perfect. Okay, and there are things, I'm raising teenagers. Bless the Lord. Those of you that have raised teenagers already, why didn't you tell me that it was hard? Rebecca was a teenager. She was not like this. (laughs) We breezed right through the teenage years with her and had nothing. And so raising teenage boys has become a challenge. And so one of the things that we say in, in correction or in discipline to my teenage sons is, son, I'm not here to be your best friend. Now, there's a time in our lives when you grow up that we'll have a friendship. Right now, it's not it. So this is it. You live by my rules. We'll take all the doors off the, off the hinges if we have to. I will monitor any phones. Nothing is private in my house. You know that dad takes, and Jansen says amen, and Bryson says amen, right? Nothing is private in my house. If I pay for it, you better believe I'm going to open it up. And mama's the same way. So I'm not interested in being friends with kids. Why? Because trying to be friends with your kids will get you off the race. And they'll pull you over with them. And then you're suddenly both off to the side. But it comes, a race comes with discipline. And in coming with discipline, look what he says in verse number five. 
And you have forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as children. He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. And don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes each one he accepts as his child. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by its father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and are not really his at all. Ow. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline, the father of our spirits, and live forever? Verse number 10, for our heavenly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always good for us, so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. Amen. It's painful. But afterwards, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in his way. I'm going to tell you, if you're going to run this race, you can't despise the discipline of God. And you notice how he ends this scripture. And I'm, I'm moving on. I'm, I'm just about done. I'm going to say this. After he talks about the discipline, the last, the, just in the last chunk that he says, he says, verse number 12, and this is the reason I use this translation. So take a new grip. I want you to look at somebody next to you and say, get a grip. Take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. If you may came in there tonight and said, you know what, it's been a while since I ran. I'm going to tell you tonight that God's going to give you a new grip. I'm going to tell you he's strengthening some weak knees tonight. I felt it in the Holy Spirit 30 minutes ago. He's strengthening some weak knees tonight. We are in a race, and I'm going to read you. I found 53 characteristics. Does anybody run in here? Is anybody a runner? Brad was with us this morning at... Sweet child, you're not a runner. Not that kind of runner. <laughs> Little Lily raised her hand. She's like, what, five years old? Four? Huh? Six? Yeah, she raised her hand. She's a runner. Brad was with me this morning, and, and he runs like three or four or five miles a day. Total insanity to me. I don't understand it, but that could be why he's skinny and I'm not. But I'm going to say to you that I found on the Internet 53 things, characteristics of a runner. Now, I'm not going to read all 53, so don't fall out on me. I'm just going to read the ones that I, that I thought were, went with what I was talking about. Now, keep in mind, I'm talking about a spiritual race, but I'm going to read you someone's interpretation of a natural runner. And you put them together, okay? Number one is this, and Bruce to put them on. Number one, don't be a whiner. Nobody likes a whiner. I hate whiners. You know who they are. Oh, how are you doing tonight? Oh, Lord, I just barely got in this place. You just don't know what I'm going through. I, if you're going to run a race, don't be a whiner. Well, you say, don't be a whiner. That's hard stuff, isn't it? The next thing, walking out the door is often the toughest part of the run. If the enemy can keep you grounded, isolated, alone, then you won't run. Remember the first part of the scripture, because we are surrounded by a group of witnesses. If the enemy can isolate you, you'll stop running. Guaranteed. Don't. Walking out the door is often the toughest part of the run. Number, the next one, three. During group training runs, don't let anyone run alone. We should be running together. We should be fasting together. The, the things that we are called to do, according to Scripture, is give and fast and pray. Right? We should be praying together. There's pa when you pray, God hears you. When you pray corporately, all of heaven hears you. Because we, are praying we should be praying together. We should be giving together. You were talking about the personal. You were talking about the, the, the giving. And if you give 25 cents, and, and, and you'll, you'll receive the same reward as anybody else. But do you also know that that means corporately as well? If we give as a corporate body, then as a corporate body, we will receive the reward. If we don't give as a corporate body, we will receive the curse. I know you just heard David Thompson coming out of me because that's the influence he's had on me this last year. And I'm going to say something you've heard a thousand times. It only took one Aiken to mess up a whole camp. 
<laughs> but that's the truth. That's truth. The things that we've got to be doing together. If you stay by yourself, you won't run. You'll be out of church. You won't run. The next thing is key promises, especially ones you made to yourself. The next one I love. Keep a quarter in your pocket. One day you'll need to call, a, call for a ride. The race is sometimes hard. That's why we got to have other people to call for help sometimes. The next one, don't compare yourself to other runners. Oh, but look at, just look at sister so-and-so. I wish I could sing like her. I wish I could do. Don't compare yourself to other runners. Run your own race. The next one, when standing in starting lines, remind yourself how fortunate you are to be there. Be thankful. Oh, God, if it hadn't been for you. If it hadn't been for your love, if it hadn't been for Jesus, then where would I be? Be thankful when you're in starting lines. Be thankful. Getting out of shape is much easier than getting into shape. It's that seven days without prayer makes one week thing that you remember seeing on the signs. Getting out of physical shape, spiritual shape, is what takes us to, to uh, is much easier than getting into shape. Next one. Don't talk about your, your running injuries. People don't want to hear about your sore knee. Now, I'm not, I, I, I kind of, I'm on the line with that one, except here's, here's what I'm going to say. I want to hear what happened to you if you, won't, if you don't just leave me there. Oh, but look, my whole family fell apart. Don't you, no, but, but what's God doing in the situation? That's, don't leave me there at your brokenness. Because God didn't leave you in your brokenness. Now, you may still be wallowing around with it, but the whole time he's at the finish line saying, get up, come on, let's move forward. Dust yourself off, weak knees are coming together, and get a new grip, right? Amen. Amen. It makes me think of 2 Corinthians 4, 8-8, through 8, where it says, we are pressed on every side. We are troubled but not crushed. We are perplexed but not driven to despair. We are hunted down but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down but we are not destroyed. Don't leave me just at your injury. Say, you know what, I, maybe, you know, this year we got knocked down a few times. I know that we got knocked down but we weren't out. And we weren't, down, we weren't down for the count. And guess what? Every time the enemy knocks us down, we're going to get up. And we're going to get up swinging and fighting for everything that's inside of us. The next one is this. Approach running as if the, as if the quality of your life depended on it. Now, spiritual running, you, you understand? Next one. No matter how slow you run, it's still faster than someone sitting on the couch. Yes, sir. That's good. Races aren't just for those who can run fast. There are no shortcuts to running excellence. The best runs sometimes come on days when you didn't feel like running at all. There's nothing boring about running. There are, however, boring people who run. We should be the most excited group of people. It should be a shock that the, that the Hispanic uh, restaurant down uh, just across the street should be louder than us. It should be a shock if we're able to hear them. It should be a shock that if when we go somewhere, we are Christians should not be boring people. We have a redeemer. We've been called by a name that's set apart them from it. We, we have an access to the throne of God. And yet, we can be boring. Hey, you're looking at a guy who spent a good percentage of his life being one of the most boring people you've ever seen. I was 13 years old, and it was like I was 30. Oh, to be 30 again. <laughs> I was 13 years old. Like the, I didn't do the things that I have these kids do over here sometimes, I would have never done them. A couple of years ago, we had a Grinch Christmas party, and I painted my face green. Like the, you've seen the Grinch on TV. I painted my face green, and my nose was black, and I wore a cape. And I remember coming out of getting all my stuff together, and my wife looked at me and said, I am not believing this. I was boring. Thank God he called me out of boringness. And he called me on a race, and I'm excited to run. The next one, I love this. Look at hills as the opportunity to pass people. Don't look at a hill as an obstacle. <laughs> but look at it as an opportunity to show perseverance and stamina and determination. When tempted to stop being a runner, make a list of the reasons you started. Next one, go for broke, but be prepared to be broken. Make progress in your training, but progress at your own rate. 
The next one, runners who never fail are runners who never try anything great. Next one, never tell a runner that he or she doesn't look good in tights. Hey, I know that's a physical run. I'm talking in the spiritual too. I am so tired of the church world that says, did you see where that earring was in that guy? Did you see the tattoo he had on his on him? Did you see what she did you see that she wore pants in the, inside the church house? Did you see that she doesn't measure up to our godliness? Don't ever tell a runner that he doesn't look he or she doesn't look good in their running outfit. You let God decide. Let's let God decide what they are supposed to run in. Now, I understand everything's got to be done in decency and order, and that's not what I'm talking about. But some of you in this building have been, have been on the receiving end of prejudice because people looked at you, and you didn't look like what, you, what they thought you should look like. And because of that, they, they said, you can't be part of us. You don't look like us. So I love when it says, never Tell a runner that he or she doesn't look good in tights. The next one, running is simple. Don't make it complicated. And the last one is this. Running is always enjoyable. Sometimes, though, the joy doesn't come till the end of the run. I'm going to tell you that this race is is, is some, it's not for, always for the faint of heart. It is, it is a race that, that sometimes we get tired. Sometimes we get weak needs. Sometimes our hands get tired. But I'm going to tell you something, that it is also one that, that, that says this. Running, it may be the end of the race. Maybe it's the end of the race before we see the complete reward. I'm going to tell you, if you are running as hard as you can run toward Jesus tonight, there's a reward coming. I don't want to just focus on that because, you know, sometimes we church people, we get in a in this loop. And the only time we can worship, Sister Carolyn, the only time we can worship and praise God is if we're singing about dying and going to heaven. And listen, I'm 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 all for that. I'm I'm looking for my the, every day that I see wickedness in this world and I see things that are happening. I say, even come, Lord Jesus. But if I just totally got focused on that, then how am I helping people in this race? How am I, today I was driving down the road singing, uh, oh, I want to see him look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. And I do want to see that. And that is my goal. And I'm looking at Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. And that's where my hope is. But I also want also this. I want to see the face of Jesus while I'm here. Oh, what's that look like? You know, it's, Pastor Jeff, it's going to mess you up. Yes, I know that. It's going to mess me up. And guess what? I'm running with some people, and I've got a crowd of witnesses around me. It's going to mess them up, too. When, I, when we start saying, oh, look, look, what, look at the face of Jesus. Look what he's doing in our lives. Look where we're going. Can you just come on and get on board? Can I encourage you to get up out of your seat? Can I encourage you to come on and let's get in this race? Will you stand with me?